Uh, welcome to Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, even though we are in this glorious room in the School of Journalism and delighted to be here. And we thank the Journalism School for allowing us to use the room tonight. Uh, but we want to welcome you to the School of International and Public Affairs Global Mayors Forum. As is our custom, our guest will speak for approximately 40 minutes, and then he will entertain questions from the floor for about 15 minutes. Ron Littlefield was elected mayor in 2005 and re-elected for a second term as mayor of Chattanooga in 2009. This will be his last term as Chattanooga mayors are term limited. Unless, of course, he meets our own mayor, Michael Bloomberg, this week and learns how to extend that. I had to say that. Mayor Littlefield brought with him many years of experience in city government and urban planning, having served as the Commissioner of Public Works, which is an elected position in Chattanooga, and as a member and chair of the city council. I think this is a person who really understands politics. But of course, that's not all to his resume. Mayor Littlefield also held the position of Economic Development Coordinator for the City of Chattanooga and Director of Planning and Operations for the Chattanooga-Hamilton County Regional Planning Commission, understanding that cities no longer sit alone but are part of counties. He has been an instructor at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, as well as a teacher for a postgraduate course in metropolitan politics and policy. Um, the fact that you are willing to teach in a university, of course, makes us very happy here. Mayor Littlefield is a 1968 graduate of Auburn University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration. It's my pleasure to introduce Mayor Ron Littlefield, who will speak tonight on Gig City, the reinvention of Chattanooga. Thank you, Professor. I still say there must be some mistake. <laughs> when my staff told me I was invited to come up here, I uh, was actually in New York back in August and uh, been my first time to drive up and drive around and look at this wonderful university. And they say, you know, you're invited to come up there and speak. And I said, well, that, they can't, can't have the right city, the right mayor, anything of that nature. But I am so pleased to be with you. And I am awed and intimidated by this wonderful room and this wonderful space. But I'm sure that some of you are still sitting there thinking, you know, what's so special about Chattanooga? And I will touch on just a few things, and then I'll get into the meat of exactly what I want to talk with you about tonight. First of all, what's special about Chattanooga is that song. <laughs> you, you, you know, yeah, see, I, I don't even have to say what song. You know what song. I was actually in Hanover, Germany last week. This is a true story. Went over there to speak to another group about Chattanooga because we've sort of gotten on the world stage. And I checked into the hotel, went down to the railroad station, which is sort of the center of life in a lot of cities, including Hanover, and they had a festival going on in front of the railroad station. Well, I always like a festival, and Germans always have a lot of good food and music and everything. And they had a band up in the bandstand playing what I would consider traditional German music, and then the music stopped. And I promise you, the next thing they started playing, I knew where they were going because that song has a particular beginning that sounds like a train starting off. And I thought, this can't be true. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> The song was Chattanooga Choo Choo, and I wanted to wave my hand in the crowd and say, I know the words in English. <laughs> I do. Um, same thing happened in Ipswich, Australia. Once I was attending a gathering there, and the band got into big band music, and you don't play big band music without playing Chattanooga Choo Choo. And I was thinking last night when I went going down the subway, and we went through the Pennsylvania station stop, the lyrics leave the Pennsylvania station at a quarter to four, read a magazine and then you're in Baltimore. 
can't get away from it. But I go everywhere in the world and I ask people, do you, have you ever heard of Chattanooga? Everybody has because of that song. <laughs> and they're, they're sort of disappointed when I tell them it's a city and not a train, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. What's special about Chattanooga? Second thing, Adolph Ox. Really? If you look out the back of the conference room in the mayor's office on the third floor of City Hall, a couple of blocks away is a beautiful dome building. And when I have people there from New York, I love to take them back there. It's a beautiful place anyway. Our City Hall was built 100 years ago and it's just a marvelous space. And I point to that building and I say, you know, we're the mothership. The New York Times actually started in Chattanooga because Adolph Ox built the Chattanooga Times into a successful newspaper and then came to New York and the rest, as they say, is history. He's our first citizen too, just like he's yours. Then there's Coca-Cola. I was in Shanghai talking to a group with the uh, Urban Land Institute and it was a group from all over the world and the question always comes up, why is Chattanooga here? And I said to the group, reach over there and pick up that little red can in front of you. <laughs> that can, of course, the script didn't look quite like it looks in the United States, but I said, that can wouldn't be here if it weren't for Chattanooga because Coca-Cola, yes, it started in Atlanta. It was an Atlanta product. It was a fairly successful product, but they were selling it in drugstore, um, in, in, in drugstore, uh, um, What's the term? Uh, soda fountains. Soda fountains. When was the last time you bought something in a soda fountain in a drugstore? <laughs> well, three guys from Chattanooga had the idea to bottle it and they went down and, and bought the rights to bottle it for a dollar because the uh, fellow who uh, was starting Coca-Cola didn't really think it was that great of an idea, but he let them take it and run with it and, and they did and so it became an international product. Final thing that's special about Chattanooga, and this is indeed special transformation. I tell people proudly, and it's not a Chamber of Commerce-like statement, I've been around enough to know. I truly believe that Chattanooga, not just because of what I have been able to do, but what so many people have been able to do in a very unique and special way, is the most transformed city in America. I say that shamelessly because I know from whence we have come. And I know that we are positioned to be a very much more special city. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. Chattanooga, I had one of those PowerPoint presentations. I was glad to hear that you weren't set up for PowerPoint presentations because they, they make us all lazy. And I'd rather invite you to use your imagination, those mental pictures. There's a little picture of Chattanooga on the front of the brochure here. But if you can imagine, it's a city that is sitting in a topographic bowl. It's uh, down amidst mountains and ridges, and it has this wonderful river that flows through the very downtown. A significant river, fifth largest river in the United States, flowing right through downtown with all the bridges and things that just make a city truly a beautiful place in so many ways to look at it from so many prominent locations around the city. And until a few years ago, someone remarked, a best-selling author said he was driving into Chattanooga, this was a few decades ago, and he topped one of those mountains and he looked down and he said, you know, the, God gave these people a beautiful setting for a city and they've done very little with it. <laughs> And that unfortunately was true. We could not argue with that because it was in pretty sad shape. Cities are established for commerce. That's why they came into being, I'm sure, most of them. I can't imagine other reasons except for commerce in its broadest generalist term. And the first means of commerce was water travel, in our case, rivers. And so the river became the location for what was to become Chattanooga. It was first Ross's Landing. It was a trading post of the Native Americans, primarily the Cherokee Nation. And John Ross was the first citizen of Chattanooga well back before Adolph Ox in the 1700s, early 1800s. 
we were Indian territory. And Ross's Landing uh, played a major role in starting the city until that unfortunate circumstance, that, that uh, holocaust of, of our part of the world, the Trail of Tears, took most of the Native Americans, including John Ross, away from Chattanooga in the 1830s. If you look at early depictions of Chattanooga, they're very interesting photographs. We did have early photographs because we were a Civil War community and therefore we had those photographers that came up and followed the battles and so forth. And significant battles of the American Civil War were fought south of Chattanooga, which was Chickamauga, and then Chattanooga and the uh, Great Locomotive Chase, which has been depicted by Walt Disney and others, actually started in Atlanta and ended in Chattanooga. And so we had a lot of photography way back when, in the early stages. Now most southern cities in the United States trace their origins to agriculture. Uh, even Atlanta, if you look at the reason that, that cities were, it was frequently trading in cotton and other uh, agricultural goods that were in the south. Chattanooga, Birmingham, Alabama, a couple of others were different. We were industrial cities. If uh, I was showing you that PowerPoint presentation, there would be a picture up on the screen of the bluffs of the Tennessee River. And there are a couple of buildings hanging on the bluff. Very scenic picture. And if you knew Chattanooga today, you would think one of those buildings must have been the beginnings of what became the Hunter Art Museum. Beautiful place, prominent place in Chattanooga. No, it was a foundry hanging on the cliff. And if you look at early pictures of Chattanooga, they, uh, they always had smokestacks. And if they were drawings or paintings, the artist felt obligated to put smoke pouring out of the smokestacks because in that period of time, in the industrial age, smoke meant success, it meant money. Uh, people said, and it was unfortunately also quite true, Smoke smells like money to me. Well, Chattanooga had lots of it. And uh, then we progressed in the industrial era from rivers to rails. Well, again, commerce was the reason. And rails, you think, okay, that's where Chattanooga, Choo Choo, and where all that came from. Yes, we were a rail center. We were a major crossroads of rails and that's why we were prominent in the Civil War and we were compared with Atlanta back then because those rails of commerce crossed through Chattanooga and brought a lot of money once again into our community and it fueled the industrial age even more in our area, more smoke. And remember this was the steam era. I have a picture on my wall in my office that it's one of those panoramic shots that was taken over a hundred years ago. Interestingly enough, a friend of mine found it in a shop in California. He realized that it was a picture from Chattanooga, so he bought it and brought it home to me, and it hangs in my office. And it's black and white, of course, a hundred years before, and you can make out some of the buildings that are still there that, that survived urban renewal and things of that nature. And you can see that there's one bridge, which is now our walking bridge, the Walnut Street Bridge, which if you come to Chattanooga, you'll get to walk along it, and it's a beautiful place. But in addition to being black and white, when you got over to the right side of the picture, it got very gray, and you might think that it was a problem with photography. No, it was smoke, because that's where the railroad stations were. Then we went to roadways. Eisenhower interstate system, the envisioned uh, way to replace railroads for passenger travel, inspired by uh, General Eisenhower's experience in Europe with the Autobahns and all of that. Once again, Chattanooga was there when the decisions were made and major interstate highways crossed through Little Chattanooga, Interstate 75. Some people call it the Main Street of America, running all the way from the tip of Michigan down to the tip of Florida. Interstate 24, likewise running east and west, coming right through downtown Chattanooga. And then Interstate 59, which runs from Chattanooga to New Orleans, 
a kind of a curious interstate. I really can't imagine why it was built, but it's there and it connects us with Birmingham and the major cities of Mississippi and of course the great city of New Orleans. The rivers of commerce had gone from water to steel to um, concrete and asphalt roadways. And that brought with it something else, sulfur dioxide, oxides of nitrogen, smog. If I were showing you that PowerPoint, we have a famous picture from that era of a car disappearing into a smog bank. You can see the back of the car sticking out and you think, well, something must have been on fire. Yeah, something was. And it was the city of Chattanooga back then. In 1969, no less than Walter Cronkite told the world on his evening news, watched by millions, that the dirtiest city in America was Chattanooga, Tennessee. 1969. It was not a Chamber of Commerce moment for us <laughs> in Chattanooga. And I had moved there out of college in 1968, and I was working for the State Planning Commission back then, and I had to admit it was a pretty dirty, gritty place. I worked mostly with the communities right around Chattanooga, and they were affected by it too. We had some businesses that were thriving very well. Our TB and Respiratory Disease Hospital was, was doing <laughs> all right, and the doctors were doing well as, 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 uh, also. And it wasn't just the air, but the water was polluted. That beautiful river had signs along the way that said, avoid human contact, because the industrial pollution that was not only going into the air was going into the water and it was affecting our community and we were not unlike all those Rust Belt cities. We were, as some described it, a Rust Belt city in the South. Well, in the 1970s, we began to clean up our act. We were at the bottom of that bowl. That topographic bowl served like a bottle and when we had temperature inversions, it would capture all the pollution and so we really didn't have a choice. We had to strictly reduce, remove that form of pollution and we were very successful at it. In the 70s we began to clean our air and we got ourselves into compliance with, at that time of course the Environmental Protection Agency was created about this time. We were responding first to the US Public Health Service, that's when we were declared dirtiest in America and as EPA came online we began to work with them and we came into compliance with EPA requirements. But while we were cleaning the air and also cleaning the water, we continued to decline as a city. We were a Rust Belt city in the south and we were experiencing the same sort of things that those cities were experiencing. There was a list that was published every year and uh, I remember that we would wait for it to come out and it would talk about the top 10 industrial cities in the country. <laughs> top 10 industrial cities. And our local manufacturers were always proud that Chattanooga was in that list, in the top 10. And interestingly enough, they never really mentioned much about the list except where Chattanooga was in the list of top 10 cities. And so as the 70s went by and we started cleaning up our act, we began to fall down that list. And so uh, I was walking across one of our downtown parks one morning and a fellow who was active in industrial development met me and said, Ron, what are we going to do about Chattanooga's position on the list? And I said, what list? I think, thought I knew what he meant. He said, you know the list of top 10. We used to always be in the top 10. Now we're, then we were 11th and now we're 13th and we're, we're falling down on the list. And I said, well, have you ever seen the list? And he said, no, he hadn't really. I said, do you know who else is on the list? No, he didn't. So we happened to be right across the street from the Manufacturers Association. We walked over and asked the gentleman if we could see that list that was published so prominently every year and that we were falling down the list. And he was kind of reluctant to show it to us. And so finally we persisted and he, he brought it out. And at the top of the list was Flint, Michigan. <laughs> Next was Carroll, Illinois and Gary, Indiana. And you can go down the list. It was those cities that were really, really beginning to go through wrenching change because they were so invested in those heavy industries that were polluting industries that were no longer viable for a number of reasons. Chattanooga had been in that list, but we had begun to fall down on the list. After that, a reporter asked me where I thought Chattanooga should be on the list. 
Because the list, interestingly, was, was not what you would expect. It was the percentage of your non-farm population employed in manufacturing. It wasn't the, you know, it wasn't comparing uh, Detroit's and things of that nature. It was comparing cities that were heavily invested in manufacturing. At the bottom of the list was Fort Lauderdale, Florida and Las Vegas, Nevada. Because at that time they had, well, very little, if any, manufacturing back in the 70s. They have more now. And the reporter asked me where I thought Chattanooga should be in the list and I said somewhere in the middle. That, of course, got in the news, and the head of the Manufacturers Association never spoke to me again after that <laughs> because he thought I had said something uh, nasty about manufacturing, and I really did not mean to diss manufacturing. I simply meant to say that a balanced economy and a balanced community is a stronger community, and I still stand by that. Um, as we cleaned our air and our water, we noticed that our downtown was in total disrepair, a lot of it vacant. Our riverfront, which had been where Chattanooga started, was covered with dilapidated, dangerous old warehouses and things that, that well, you've seen it in other cities. We were very characteristic of those cities that were struggling. And so uh, we had to decide how we were going to deal with this. And uh, there had been the common belief in Chattanooga, and I'm sure it was based partly on fact, because every city at one time, particularly during the industrial age, had a power structure. And so there was the prevailing feeling in Chattanooga that the power structure were controlling everything. And if you ask someone, why aren't we doing better as a city, they'd say, well, it's the power structure. You know, they don't want anything to come here. They like cheap labor and all this, and so it's the power structure. So we began to examine that thought and ask people who were the power structure. And we got names from a number of people. And comparing those names with who actually was living, we found that a lot of them were dead, <laughs> and we found that m many others had moved away to Florida and were no longer trying to control things if they ever did in Chattanooga. So we were like adolescent children who had grown up, and we were blaming our parents for everything, and it was still our problem, and we had to deal with it. So we had to figure a way to get people engaged. Now, students, when I got out of school and I started in planning, I was convinced that I had all the answers. And that all I needed to do, and these, this among my peers working in planning at the time, all they needed to do was listen to us. And we would draw pretty plans and colorful maps, and this was before digital anything. And so we did it with color pens and so forth. And it was very artistic, and we had a lot of fun doing that. And we had a lot of fun writing the plans and so forth, and the thicker the better. <laughs> and we'd take them over and present them to the elected officials and say, here's the answer for economic development, for land use planning, all of those things. And they would thank us and smile and promise to do things and those plans would go on the shelf and nothing would ever really happen with them. So here we were with a city that was declining and, and sinking and losing not just jobs but losing its young people. And that was perhaps the most perilous and difficult thing to deal with. You can replace industry. It's very hard to replace young minds. And so we said, okay, young minds and old minds and all those critics of Chattanooga, you're invited to come and dream big dreams and plan big plans and then let's see what we can do with that. It started with a trip that some of us had taken to the city of Indianapolis. We took 52 people to Indianapolis. This was in 1982 because Indianapolis, is anyone here from Indianapolis? way back then was known as India No Place. <laughs> and they had had a couple of very dramatic elected officials that had begun to turn things around in Indianapolis and we wanted to go see how a city took control of its own future. 52 people. William Hudnut was mayor at the time. And uh, he showed us all around all of the wonderful things they were doing in Indianapolis. And they had done some audacious things. I love the term audacity 
because at that time Indianapolis had built a football stadium without a football team. <laughs> this was before they stole the Colts. They stole the Colts a few months after we got back and we thought, well, they, they must have known something about what they were doing. But they had moved with audacity and they had done it by having a group which Mayor Hudnut called the Greater Indianapolis Progress Committee, which was dozens and dozens of people. It was really more than a committee, it was a sounding board. And he had very carefully picked them from all the different walks of life in Indianapolis and forced them into a room and said, okay, in so many ways we don't get along with each other, but we have one thing in common and that's the future of this city. And he forced them to come up with some things that they could do. And they came up with ideas like the, river, the White River Park and a number of other very dramatic changes, including let's go get a major football uh, team. And uh, lots of cities do that, but few build a stadium before they have a team. That's part of the deal. But Indianapolis had a new attitude about the future. And we came back to Chattanooga and we formed something called Chattanooga Venture, blatantly stealing the idea, shamelessly, from Indiana. Indiana. And uh, it was with a large board. And the thing that we did, because Chattanooga had this thing about unions and captains of industry, we recruited the captains of industry to be on the board, some of the most prominent names in Chattanooga, who normally fought unions like crazy. And then we sat them across the table from the union people that they normally fought with. We had, um, in the leadership of this corporation, the head of the Teamsters Union. We had a major uh, local black minister who represented another element of the community. We, we did exactly what Indianapolis did. We pulled people together from all walks of life and we said, here's the thing, you know, the power structure is no longer controlling the city if it ever did. It certainly hasn't recently. And it certainly isn't going to do what we want it to do. We've got to do it ourselves. And so we went through a wrenching process of self-examination, which we called Vision 2000. It's called visioning now, it's common, but back then, in the mid-1980s, it was not common. And we'd pull people together in a room like this, and when I tell it, people say, oh yeah, I've done that. Well, you hadn't back then. And we would say, okay, here is the future. And we would present them with what we call the vision question. We broke the future of Chattanooga into five categories, people issues, place issues, work issues, play, and government. And we would tell people something like this, okay, by then it was 1984, a remarkable year if you think about it in literature anyway, and we would say, it's 1984, the year 2000 is only 16 years away. Now I'm looking around the room, I can see some people old enough to know that there was a time when the year 2000 was considered space time, you know, that was going to be uh, George Jetson. We were going to be flying around in, in, in spaceships and helicopters and all that sort of thing. But no one really thought it was going to happen. And we'd say 16 years from now, it's going to be the year 2000. And then to be a little more dramatic, we'd hold our hand down like this and say the graduating class of the year 2000 is already here. You know, we're not waiting for them to show up, they're here. And they're this tall and they're running around our knees. And if this is going to be the kind of city we want it to be in 16 years for these children to inherit, we have to start now. And then we would have people go to the tables and we would, we would hash out through a very carefully structured process what the future of Chattanooga was going to be. And it wasn't one of those big, thick, colorful plans like we planners like to, to do just a few years before. It was just a short list, a work list of things that we could do. We thought that one of the more audacious things that we could do was build the largest freshwater aquarium in the United States. Well, Baltimore had rediscovered their inner harbor and built the National Aquarium, a saltwater aquarium. Boston had built one and uh, had rediscovered Faneuil Hall and so forth. But there was no freshwater aquarium and there was our riverfront sitting there in total disrepair. And if we really wanted to shock people and say, you know, Chattanooga is pretty serious about this, this environmental stuff, we would build something as audacious as the largest aquarium. And it started small. And without going into all the particulars, uh, it, it just was like a snowball. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it went from a publicly financed facility to a totally privately financed facility 
with public money then going into some of the surrounding plazas and so forth, which made it a more complete project. And there were many other things that we had on that short list, including things that people don't focus on, like creating a family violence shelter because we had had for years and years battered women coming down to City Hall saying, can't you do something to help us? And year after year, nothing was happening. And so someone else with the, at the conclusion of Vision 2000 said, by golly, we're gonna get that done. And they raised the money and they did it and it still exists. That's the full range of things that Chattanooga did to turn itself around. Well, the future of Chattanooga today is quite different than it was just a few years ago. We have gone from a city that was dependent upon river to a city that was dependent upon rail to a city that was dependent upon roads. And uh, looking toward the future with a recovered downtown, with a riverfront that is the envy of many, we had to think, how do we position ourselves for the future? Every city has to do something with its electrical utility. Chattanooga has uh, the Electric Power Board, which is a city-owned utility, and they came to me and said, you know, we have to build a smart grid. What's a smart grid? I'm not that smart. And they said, well, it's something that controls the electrical utility and determines when you have an outage how to reroute the electricity. It's not something that most people are very interested in, but it's very important because downtime for industry, downtime for anything, the loss of electrical power is an important element. And uh, I said, well, tell me, uh, how do we do this? And they said, well, there are really two ways that we can do it. We can do it with copper wires, which we have, but if we really want to do it the way the future requires, we'll do it with fiber optics. Well, tell me about that. Well, in that you will extend fiber optics because, again, going back to our railroad history, fiber lines had been run along railroad lines, and a lot of it was still dark fiber, but it connected important parts of the United States, and it was only just beginning to be utilized. This was just a few years ago. And uh, they said we could, and we could build a network that ties our entire community together with fiber to every house and to every business. Well, why don't we do it? Because it's very expensive. But it is what has to be done if we're going to be a community of the future. This was before the Google cities and before all those other things that we were talking about. And they told me these were the engineers that were normally just dealing with the electrical system. If we build it, we can save probably 30 to 40 million dollars a year. Well, that will pay off a lot of bonds. And so they went into a planning process. My education is in business. I do not claim to be any kind of a business person. But we have a board that runs this electrical utility, even though it's city owned. And I had carefully named to that board the best business minds that we had in Chattanooga. And they spanned the political uh, uh, boundaries of our community. We had a very conservative Republican, as you would expect, in the business community. Uh, a fellow who had run for office successfully and served in a number of capacities. And then we have for what, what passes for a liberal Democrat at the other end in the South. Uh, he might be conservative in some places, but the reason I say that. But, uh, and then in between, we had the head of uh, our Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, company, which is headquartered in Chattanooga, and we had a couple of other people with extremely good business credentials. And they'd gone through a planning process, constructing a business plan for this undertaking. And it literally filled a shelf. But these business minds, decided that it was something that should be done. And I told the city council and others, when you get something that is supported by a spectrum of our community politically and the best business minds, it's something we should take seriously. So we embarked on this, which was going to cost over $300 million, which is a lot of money for Chattanooga, Tennessee. Well, sometimes fortune favors the bold, it really does. And this sounds like, well, this would, should have been discouraging to you, but just as we started through this process to build it out, the economy went south. This was about 19, I mean, two, 2007, when things really started going badly 
for the national economy. And stimulus money, that much maligned uh, political football that's passed around nowadays, became available. And what was stimulus money looking for? Shovel-ready projects. Well, we had a project that was already shoveling. It was ready. And we applied for and received a $111 million grant. Fortune favors the bold. And the terms of that grant were simply that we had to build it out. We had to serve the more underserved parts of the city and serve them first. And we promised that we would do that because we wanted to do it anyway. So the effect of all of that, fast forward to now, is that we have the largest, most robust, as they say, in uh, digital talk, uh, system in the country. I was speaking in Copenhagen, Denmark, about our accomplishment as a city with 170,000 people connected by fiber with gigabit connectivity. I'm not even sure what a gigabit is, <laughs> but I know that it's something that we have and everyone else wants. <laughs> and the speaker that was a couple before me had a world map on his PowerPoint presentation and it went, it was the full world, you know, spread out across a couple of screens. And he showed the dozen or so communities, and these were dots of cities over 100,000 with gigabit connectivity. And there were only a few in Asia and Europe. And there was one dot in the United States. One. And I was sitting there wanting to leap forward, and he said, yeah, that's Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I'm sure their mayor will tell you about that in just a few minutes. But that's where we are. We are a community that has gone from the dirtiest city in America to a community that has uh, a resource that we know the future is going to require. And uh, we, we are, we're not proud of it in the sense that we're running around like Chamber of Commerce people spewing about it. But I tell people when they ask me, I feel like the mayor of the first city to have fire because I'm sure there was a time when fire was precious and people said, well, they've got fire over there. Well, what can they do with it? Well, they can light their caves, they can cook with it. Uh, you know, there are a few things they can do, but no one at that time had actually explored what you could do with fire. No one has fully explored yet what you can do with this kind of robust broadband connectivity. I'm looking at this gentleman here who we were talking about it earlier. As a city planner, I love to tell people way back when that I felt that I could predict with some reasonable success that if you installed infrastructure, those old types of infrastructure, if you get beyond water, which we, we never needed to build canals, but if you built railroads or you built roads or then the other infrastructure, sewers, water lines, all of those things, and then I'm old enough to remember the uh, electrification of some of the rural parts of the United States. And I can remember when even in small towns and cities, not everyone had a telephone. But we all see what has happened as technology has made greater and greater use of those particularly, uh, at one time, unique means of commerce. And so uh, I have told people Chattanooga has gone through the four R's. We've gone through river, royal, roads, and then I couldn't think of an R that described this. But routers comes pretty close, you know. It is because the future is not water now or steel or concrete and asphalt. It's glass. If I had that PowerPoint up here, the infrastructure of the future is a little glass fiber about the size of my small finger and extended to 170,000 people in a 600 square mile area. Chattanooga is uh, a city that is blessed and we are finding ways to use it. 6,200 miles of fiber, 378,000 splices, and again, gigabit connectivity. One of the last pictures I have in my PowerPoint presentation that you haven't been watching all this time, but I hope you've been filling your mind with visions, is a picture of a newspaper and a stack of books. 
because what is happening now is so dramatic. I was in Barnes and Noble here, down on Broadway earlier this evening, and uh, looking at the nooks and all of those things. The digitization of the printed word is dramatic. I've talked to authors, they don't really know what they're going to do with it. We had a, a best-selling author in Chattanooga and she was telling me about her books and so forth and I said, well, you know, uh, our library is dealing with this. We're connecting our library to this gigabit connectivity and we're going to be using the full force of all of that uh, digital capability for whatever is happening in publishing in the future. And she said, well, you know, as an author, of course, she depended upon selling books. And she said, I always said I was never going to give up taking a printed book with me. But she said, then I got one of those readers. And people, she was not my age, but people my age can particularly appreciate the fact with those readers you can increase the font size, you know. <laughs> And I see people sitting on planes and see people sitting in church reading their Bibles on the readers and on their phones and things of that nature. And uh, there's a beautiful library in this university right over there. And on those smartphones that we all carry around, there's a bookshelf app. And you can put an entire library now on a smartphone. And things are just going to continue to go in that direction. So I used to be able to tell people I know where things are going, but I have to say now that I don't know where things are going. In our library, which we are filling with all this gigabit connectivity and capability, is a statue of Adolf Ox. And I was just thinking about that tonight when I was preparing to come over and talk to you. I think Adolf Ox would approve of where things are going. And uh, in fact, I think that uh, Chattanooga has something else perhaps to teach even cities like New York. We have done other things which other people have asked me about and I won't go into all that because I do want to take your questions and I have talked as long as I was allowed. Um, we have found that we can use this capability to do things even like controlling street lights. We've installed LED lighting throughout the city. And Chattanooga, like other cities, suffers from uh, some unrest from time to time. Some things started as flash mobs, which were fun for a while, and then they became nasty. And we found that in our parks where things sometimes got ugly on rare occasions, then that wonderful soft lighting that we had didn't fully serve the purpose, that the lighting didn't quite give us the capability to use the cameras, which are again part of this digital age. And so we now have the ability for our police officers to go online in their laptops in their police cars and ramp the light up to almost daylight capability or bring it down to another level if, if we want to create a different kind of mood. Or they can even make the light strobe to lead people out of an area where there's some kind of a dangerous thing happening, things of that nature. But interesting, innovative ways to make use of this new capability that we have. Chattanooga is the most transformed city in America. And it's, it's not just those things that we're known for, including the song. It's the entrepreneurial spirit and the inventiveness of a number of people that show that there is life after near death in a city. Come to Chattanooga and we would welcome you. Thank you very much. You. Questions? This is a matter of record. I met with officials of AT&T and with Comcast that respectively pretty well controlled monopolies in telephone and in uh, video. And I said, here's what we're planning to do. And they said, we don't think you should do that. And they gave me all sorts of economic reasons. And I told them about the, that business plan and, and the fact that we had these business people that covered a broad spectrum of the political uh, arena. And uh, I said, we think that the future requires us to do it. And if you will install the fiber, we will piggyback what our needs are on your fiber. And they said, we can't afford to. 
Well, I said to both of them, particularly to the AT&T people who are still using crinkly old copper wires, at that time I had their DSL service at my house and I said, you cannot afford not to because every time it rains, my DSL service goes out at my house because the wires are, are fractured. Well, they held out and then we proceeded forth and they Comcast sued us four times. <laughs> But they didn't succeed because, remember what I said, it was done for the sake of managing the system. And it paid for itself on that basis alone. And the court said the fact that they can do all these other things with it, that's okay. They can't be prohibited from building a system that makes it cheaper and more efficient to operate an electrical system. So now the cat's out of the bag. I know there are other places where they're trying to stop it. I hope that that doesn't succeed because I really think that if this, it, it, I'm, I'm glad to see the Google cities moving forward. That's Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, I did when they announced that they were going to have gigabit connectivity. I, I sent a kind of a sarcastic tongue in cheek letter to the mayors of those two cities who I know and invited them to come to Chattanooga and see how it looks once you get it all set up. But Google <laughs> is a wonderful thinking machine and uh, it employs those wonderful young minds that, that will think of new ways to use this wonderful tool that we have. And so I'm excited that Google is, is uh, in the inventive part of this. But I think that there, we'll have those setbacks, that there will be those companies that will try to put the brakes on it, and successfully perhaps for a while. But then they will have to install it, and then we will all have access to that same thing. The U.S. Department of State Foreign Service makes you really appreciate your country and just want to tell you how very proud I am of you. Thank you. And of Chattanooga, really. Um, also, this young man is too shy to tell you he's from Chattanooga. Oh. <laughs> we let a few get away, but then we pull them back. Yeah. It's just like the Godfather. <laughs> so, uh, with my new quest now to see America first, you know? Yeah. Uh, you can expect to see me in Chattanooga soon. So could you tell us a little bit about what's going on with your tourist, tourism? Our tourism market is expanding dramatically in Chattanooga. We were always a pretty city, but we really didn't take advantage of it. We had some of those old roadside attractions, and if you've ever driven south, you know the Rock City, Ruby Falls signs, all those, and they're still there. And uh, when we decided to, to build the aquarium, they were at first upset about it and then ultimately decided, well, a rising tide raises all boats. And that, in fact, has proven to be true. Our tourism market, which I gauge by um, hotel motel tax revenue, has been increasing at a double digit rate every year. And uh, we're trying to keep up with it. Throughout the downturn, we were building hotels and all of that. Um, one thing that I left out, which I should have included, is the fact that we have been very successful in terms of industrial development as well. And uh, that started with Alstom, which was an old industrial uh, company. They owned an old complex. Alstom is a national company. And they chose Chattanooga over other cities. And a make or break part of the deal was that they would come to Chattanooga if we would extend our river walk down to where their plant was. Well, that told me that tourism and economic development, pure economic development in some people's terms, industrial development, are interlinked. The same way with that other thing that I failed to mention, which was Volkswagen. Uh, those Passats that you see advertised in publications and on television now are all made in Chattanooga. Volkswagen chose Chattanooga not because of the economic incentives that we offered, but because of what they characterized as the intangibles. They made the announcement from our art museum and they waved, the, the gentleman who made the announcement waved his hand toward all the riverfront and all of that. And so that again is interlinked because industry now has people parading through there all the time to see how Chattanooga managed to attract probably the biggest home run in, uh, in the southeastern U.S. history, Volkswagen, which then was so inspired by the things we had done with the environment, proceeded to build the first platinum lead certified plant in the world. A billion dollar plant, thousands of acres, 
and totally LEED certified. Now, that has uh, fueled up a lot of people who really want to see how a little city like Chattanooga managed to do it, and we did it through quality of life. Next. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, we have an extraordinary story. I'm Anne Fuge, Chair of the Commission on Women's Issues for the City. Um, I, I was actually going to the story of your incentives, the tax incentives, how, mm -hmm. you, how you grew uh, entrepreneurship in your city, how you actually attracted these huge companies. And I knew you, some of those stories before you, you just have told, told us the extraordinary story about Volkswagen. But I wonder, what did you do tax-wise, structure-wise, financially, to incent people to stay in Chattanooga, to build companies, to be entrepreneurs, et cetera? Thank you. Well, we, uh, if you go back to the early 1980s, the city had a a uh, policy against offering any tax incentives whatsoever. And that changed because after a number of years of realizing that uh, perhaps it would be okay if everyone would quit offering tax incentives, then we would be dealing with a level playing field. But we looked at really, to, to put it simply, at what other communities were offering and we matched it. And uh, we have a matrix constructed based on the number of jobs uh, the investment and so forth. And of course Volkswagen maxed out that whole thing because a billion dollar investment and what they promised was 2,000 jobs. It turned out to be uh, more than 3,500 now just in the plant. Um, but again the thing that was most remarkable to me was Alstom did not come to Chattanooga because of the tax incentives. They became because they came because we had created a quality of life that was second to none. And Volkswagen, it was the same thing, and they admitted it. They said, looking at the tax incentives, they were all pretty much the same. But uh, the intangibles, as they put it, at some point become tangible. When we were doing all of that introspection uh, and examining other communities and sometimes stealing ideas from other communities, we had a number of speakers parade through Chattanooga to tell us how other communities had done it. And one we brought to Chattanooga was James Rouse. Well, Mr. Rouse was a developer of shopping centers and he sort of repented of that. And then he was the one that had rebuilt the Baltimore Inner Harbor and found that, that he could steal the idea of the National Aquarium because Washington wasn't doing anything with it. And then he found Faneuil Hall and so forth. So he came to Chattanooga and he talked to a few hundred people in our beautiful old movie palace which had been saved from the wrecking ball many years ago by Chattanooga. And someone asked him at the end of his presentation, Mr. Rouse, how do we make this city grow? And he said something which I found to be almost uh, ridiculously simple but absolutely true. He said it's, it's like this, you make the city the best it can be for the people who already live here and the rest will take care of itself. And that is in fact true. We've proven it to be true. And where we were losing our young people, now we're attracting other people's young people. And we've gone from a city that uh, had a well-earned uh, uh, reputation as a city that was declining to a city that now has become cool. I, told, I tell people I never thought Chattanooga, Tennessee, with that old song and all of that, could ever achieve cool status. I have a son who lives in Boulder, Colorado, and a previous mayor before me, Bob Corker, who is now U.S. Senator, was always saying, we want Chattanooga to be the Boulder of the East. And I said, Bob, I have seen Boulder. We want Boulder to be the Chattanooga of the West. That's what we want to be. <laughs> and so uh, we are. We're cool. Yes, ma'am. I know you want to ask me a question. Um, Yes, uh, I appreciated your presentation having visited your city just a little over a year and a half ago and seen all your uh, all that you spoke of, including the great uh, Trail of Tears uh, bridge conversion, the waterfront right. and everything. Yeah. While I was there, I did hear a lot of self-questioning about your downtown streets, the uh, lack of uh, as many people that would make it um, vibrant and local, mm -hmm. uh, the businesses, there's the, the, the um, push still seems to be out at the malls and the effort seemed to, there was some interest in trying to bring more people down for local, not for uh, tourist reasons. 
curious to know if uh, those questions have led to any new kind of program. Well, we have incentives for people to be downtown, including we will spend tax incentives that we don't spend in the suburbs for downtown. We did this for a downtown movie theater. We've done it for downtown hotels and others. The, the, the one thing that our downtown is in a state of, of transition, and it's not a bad thing, I mentioned Blue Cross Blue Shield earlier. That is a very large insurer. They employ like 4,000 people. And over the years, they had moved into vacant buildings in downtown, and they were just kind of dominating the downtown real, real estate market. Um, a few years ago, uh, in fact, it, it was concluded during, uh, it was built during my first term. They built a new complex of buildings overlooking downtown Chattanooga and pulled all of their employees out of downtown and moved them up there. Consequently, we have a lot of empty buildings right now that are going through transition and we're encouraging people to open restaurants and to do other things that are innovative and we're providing incentives for that purpose. Uh, when Volkswagen announced, we took 110 people to Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville, South Carolina is the home of BMW in the United States, and they've been there a little longer than other automakers. Of course, Mercedes is down in Alabama, and uh, we wondered what the future was going to hold as a result of Volkswagen being in Chattanooga. And Greenville has 72 restaurants in a very short number of blocks in downtown. So we see that as something that is to be coveted and, and encouraged in downtown Chattanooga, and it's paying off. We have people trying all kinds of restaurants. We're a very international city now. Uh, you hear every language in the, in the world being spoken in the grocery line. And so we're trying to encourage people to feed people with their own types of food, and it's paying off. Yes, sir. Yes, I, I hope you'll indulge me to ask two questions. All right. Uh, the first one is um, uh, there's in some ways not such a big distance between uh, Chattanooga and New York City. New York City was an old industrial town once upon a time. Uh, yeah. Our population peaked in 1950 and declined for several decades after that. And we've also then gone through a process of reinvention. Hmm. So the first question I had was simply, yeah, how has the population of Chattanooga evolved over time? Uh, you know, is it anywhere near its old peak? Is it right? Yeah, it is. It's back to its peak and going up. We are, uh, and again, I, I, I sort of had to pinch myself and apologize. I am not a Chamber of Commerce person, mm -hmm. but the Census Bureau tells me that we are the fastest growing large city in Tennessee. Of course, percentages, based, depending upon your base. Um, we are the fourth largest city in Tennessee. Nashville and Memphis are cities of a million. Nashville is a metropolitan government, so it includes an entire county. Um, Memphis has is, is always been a large city. And so the next two cities are Knoxville and Chattanooga. Uh, Knoxville is just a few thousand larger than Chattanooga, and Chattanooga for the last few years has been growing faster than Knoxville. And still, um, to be a little bit sarcastic, I guess, I used to send little notes to the mayor of Knoxville that he should prepare to be the mayor of the fourth largest city in Tennessee instead of the third largest, and then he ran for governor and got elected. And uh, when he was doing his victory lap through Chattanooga, I said to him, I was sitting next to him at one of those luncheons, and I said, you know, I was just kidding about all of that uh, stuff. But we're doing very well and growing again and filling in the gaps. And that's what happened to a lot of old industrial cities. Um, you, you ended up with a lot of vacant lots. And so we're filling up those lots with houses that fit in the context. We're very sensitive to context in an urban environment. We don't build suburban houses in the city. And uh, we are, have a number of programs making that happen. So the second one, I'll try to be quick, which is there are two numbers that you threw out. Uh, one was the $300 million, and I wasn't entirely clear what that was covering. It's covering uh, smart grid right. and broadband. Yeah, it was, it was really the smart grid, the meters, the smart meters, and so forth. So, uh, and then the other number that you threw out was the population, which I was hearing is 170,000. Right. And so, I, you know, uh, I've, I'm still on pen and paper. I was born long enough ago that I can divide. So that comes out to about 
$1,700 or so per person. It was 170,000 users. Our electrical yeah. system, I'm glad you asked that question, actually extends out beyond our city <coughs> limits. And it's coincidental that the 170,000 businesses and homes included, or out, a lot of them are outside of the actual jurisdiction of Chattanooga. The population of the city is coincidentally 170,000. Okay. I, I guess the question is that it is a very, very big expenditure. Is there new business coming in that's going to actually be able to pay that off? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the meters themselves, uh, the, the plan apportions that cost over the whole system over a period of years to pay off the bonds. Yeah, and uh, people much smarter than me in business did the math and said if you're going to save 30 to 40 million dollars a year through outages that are that, that don't occur because you're able to reroute power you know one thing I know that if you've got a factory shut down they're losing money hand over fist and if you've got an electrical system that is not serving all of the customers they're losing money hand over fist and so with the smart system they're able to actually reroute anytime we have a storm and we've had a number of tests since we have erected this system. We've had tornadoes, we've had all of those odd things that you've had here in New York now. Uh, people who don't believe in a changing environment should come to Chattanooga, we could show them. <laughs> but uh, it's paying off and it pays off not just in savings but uh, reduced outages. Okay. Hi, my name is here. All right, there you are. I just Hi. heard the sound. My name is Gumi, and I'm a first-year student at the School for Public and International Affairs, and I'm focusing on urban social policy, as it is today. Um, I have been to Chattanooga, and you guys have great barbecue sauce, that's right, remember? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you talked about the positioning for the city in the future, and I was wondering, are there any plans to consider how Chattanooga might um, increase its prominence on a global stage? So. Um, are you guys thinking about, you know, sister cities programs or um, hosting the Olympics or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> now we let Atlanta host the Olympics and they did it very well. I don't think it'll be coming to small cities for a while. But we have a number of sister cities. We have uh, uh, two sister cities in Germany, one Hom Germany, which goes back 35 years. And we've had a number of student groups uh, over the years, a, a continuous parade of people back and forth between Hom and Chattanooga. And then our newest sister city is, of course, Wolfsburg, which is the headquarters of Volkswagen. And we're back and forth with them all the time. We're also uh, a rarity in that we have a Chinese sister city, Wuxi, which goes back more than a quarter of a century to a very different time in politics years ago. And we established a relationship with the city at that time, which was a sleepy little town with uh, uh, unpaved streets, I'm told. I didn't go at that time. But we had the officials to Chattanooga back when they first became our sister city, and someone said that they heard the Chinese delegation say, oh, we will never catch up with them here. Well, Wuxi is now a city of over four million. <laughs> And uh, we've learned a lot from them. And then we have a sister city in Israel and one in Russia and one in England. And uh, I'll miss a few if I start giving you the list. But uh, we have become an international city. And now with the industries, Alstom is French, Volkswagen is German. And they bring people from literally all over the world because they're international companies. And our university, which is not an insignificant university now, uh, it was always a small sort of a, a, a day school. And now it's a university with 12,000 students, and they're gathered from all over the world as well. What do you take? One last question. One last question. Yes, sir. My name is Chris. I'm also an urban policy student. I work at the School of Public Affairs. Um, the the most I think the most compelling um, part of um, Chattanooga's story for for me was the uh, the the kind of community I don't know for lack of a better term think tank that. The process that you saw in Indianapolis and shamelessly stolen and brought back home yeah. and got and, and used to get a number of different uh, interests involved at the same table. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, if you've heard of any other communities in the region, community leaders in the region who have kind of caught on to that? Has there been any spillover specific to that process? 
Yeah. Are you hearing that from other communities? Oh yeah, it, it actually has become rather common now. And when I tell people that we were the first, they think, oh, you're just bragging. But no, I can remember when we did it, and people thought, well, that that's not going to work. Planners are supposed to tell us how to fix things, and mm -hmm. we weren't doing that. We were letting people actually wrestle with the problems. But I'll tell you the one thing that I, I think that is an important element of how that is done, that we did in Chattanooga purposefully, to remain credible. We, uh, when we would gather people at the tables, <coughs> excuse me, we told the facilitators, when people tell you something, and we've all done that, you're around a table and they've got the flip chart up there, when they tell you something, write it down in their own words. Do not change their words. I don't care if it's grammatically correct or whatever. Um, and that proved to be very important. We've all sat in those sessions where the facilitator says, they listen to you and they say, I think I hear you saying so and so. <laughs> we didn't realize how important that was until we uh, had gone through a couple of sessions and we would have people come in and tell us what impressed them about it and what they didn't like and so forth. And a woman who said that she had always wanted to speak up and no one would listen. And she said, the thing that impressed me most about this process was that when I said something, someone wrote it down and in my own words. So we made that sort of a, of, uh, a requirement for what we now call the Chattanooga Way. And way back when we would do that, uh, when we had those sessions, we would encourage people to come and people would be doubtful, and we, we played little tricks. We'd set the room up for too few people, so if we thought 50 were coming, we'd set up for 30. And then you'd have to bring chairs in, and they'd go home and say, you know, it was a lot more successful than we thought, so people had to come <laughs> in. But that's, that's forgivable. But the other thing was we maintained credibility. We wrote it down in their own words. If they got very uh, verbose and we couldn't shut them up, we learned to hand them the pen and say, would you come write that down? And people will compress their thoughts <laughs> when they have to write it down. So we learned little tricks of the trade, and I've attended some. I know that we're trying to find ways to use this new digital age, to use websites, to use uh, Facebook, Twitter, and all of those things. And there will be successful ways to do it, but I have to say that I think the most important thing is that we go into the process without preconceived decisions about where we're going to end up. We have to let people lead the process, and that's what we learned in Chattanooga was the power. That when people help to create a plan, they also help to make that plan reality. And that's what had been missing for years. Again, thank you very much. Thank you.